crossover across Missouri out here. Good evening. Welcome to the Jewel Collin Smith Museum of Fine Art at Auburn University. I'm Imani, a second year majoring in mathematics. And I'm Madison Champion, a junior majoring in software engineering. Tonight it is our distinct pleasure to welcome you to a conversation with Andy Yoder. Our event tonight is being live streamed on Facebook and YouTube, and we want to thank you for being here, whether it's from the comfort at home or here in person. If you are here in person, please remember to silence your cell phones. And now to introduce this evening's program, please join me in welcoming Chris Malinsky, Director of Education, Engagement, and Learning at The Jewel. Thank you, Omani. Thank you, Maddie. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. My name's Chris Malinsky. As they said, I'm the Director of Education here at the museum, and I'm so glad that you're able to join us either in person or online for our conversation to celebrate the exhibition Overboard by the artist Andy Yoder. Before we begin this evening, I would like to acknowledge the history and stewardship of the original homelands and territory of the Creek indigenous peoples on which Auburn University is currently sited. Descended from the mound builders of the Mississippi River Valley, they lived here, raising families, farming, growing a variety of crops until forcibly removed during the Trail of Tears. A clan of these people, the Porch Band, remained to the south of us, and no doubt their enduring relationship with this place continues. I call forth the creek tonight because it's important for us to always seek to understand our place in the world within that long-standing history. Tonight, we celebrate Andy Yoder's Overboard exhibition. As you'll hear from Andy in a moment, the exhibition inspired by the Great Shoe Spill of 1990 is currently on display at the museum through April 1st. Andy Yoder's work has been exhibited at the International Print Center in New York, the Saatchi Gallery, the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and the Reykjavik Art Museum, among many other institutions. Andy Yoder studied at the Cleveland Institute of Art and the Skokegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine. He's been commissioned to create work for numerous public installations, including for the Columbus Museum of Art in Ohio, the ESPN Zone in New York, and Hilltop Montessori School in Brattleboro, Vermont. Andy's been our artist in residence this week working with hundreds of students in the Auburn City Schools, and it's been a special pleasure to work so closely with him, and he's been a tireless champion working with uh, students making uh, shoes inspired by his exhibition, so a special thanks to Andy for all of his extra work with us. Tonight, Andy will be in conversation with Charlie Lesh, an associate professor of English at Auburn. Professor Lesh received his PhD in Rhetoric and Writing Studies for Northeastern University in 2016. At Auburn, he teaches undergraduate and graduate courses on community public writing, subculture, space and place, and rhetorical theory. He's the author most recently of The Writing of Where, Graffiti and the Production of Writing Spaces. He spends as much time as possible reading and talking about sneakers, basketball, and graffiti. I first met Charlie last year when he brought his amazing class that was called Sneakerheads, an English class here to the museum. And in fact, Imani, who you just met, was part of that class, and that's how we met Imani as well. So it's been an ongoing, uh, inspiring engagement with Charlie and with his students, and I'm so thankful that he's able to join us tonight for this conversation. I'd also like to extend my appreciation to the entire museum staff for the important work surrounding this program. In particular, I'd like to thank my fantastic colleagues in education, my colleague Christy Barlow in particular for leading our engagement with the Auburn City Schools and what we call the Auburn Studio Project, which is an in-depth collaboration with the seventh graders who are studying art. Christy's managed an amazing team for the engagement surrounding Andy Yoder's installation and engagement this week. And we both want to extend our thanks to Stephanie Christman at East Sanford School and Tricia Oliver at Auburn High School. 
We also thank our partners, the city of Auburn, in particular, Sarah Custer and Emily Dombrowski, who have been fantastic partners on this new version of the Auburn Studio Project. I'm also grateful to our museum donors for their investments to present these and other programs and our unit leadership, President Christopher B. Roberts. Now, please join me in welcoming back to Auburn, Andy Yoder. Hi there, thank you for coming. I uh, am gonna talk about how I got to the sneakers. I wanna, I wanna show you some other projects I've done. When people ask me, uh, what sort of work do you do? What sort of materials do you use? I think you'll see after I show you some images here that it's a really difficult question to answer. And if there's some things that knitted together, it's more my point of view than it is the materials themselves, because I'll change very dramatically, as you'll see, from one project to the next. But one of the things that knits it together is randomness. And I've just come to believe that randomness is, it's something that's out there in the world. Um, it's something that some people are uh, put off by and try to avoid. But I've discovered that randomness can be actually a very positive um, and enriching sort of thing to embrace. You sort of have to be, if you're an artist, um, speaking from experience, there's, there's probably about 125 good practical reasons not to be an artist. But um, one of the good things about it is that it does teach you to embrace uncertainty, um, acknowledge mistakes that can lead to really good ideas, and, um, and make life more of an adventure. So with that in mind, I'll start showing some images and give you maybe some, a few sentences about the origin story of each piece, starting with some early pieces. Um, this was, I'll just use randomness as a theme. Um, somebody came up to me, I was working in Vermont at a, a studio center. They said, we've got this block of marble, does anybody want it? And I raised my hand. And so what do you carve in marble? When you s haven't carved in marble and you're thinking about the history of art, you're thinking about Michelangelo and Bernini and all these giant people, all this high art bearing down on you. So to sort of pull the rug out from underneath that, I decided to do something from, let's say, popular culture or everyday life in my world growing up in Ohio in the suburbs. So I made this bowling ball. But for me, what made the piece was that it was a hand carved bowling ball. I didn't consult an actual ball to know exactly where the holes were supposed to be. I think it ended up kind of in a subtle way, sort of lumpy, like a, like, a, like a skull, maybe like the head of a ghost or something, but just as a more interesting object than if I'd taken it and had it reproduced exactly, you know, in a, in a perfect globe. Uh, I forget where I came up with the idea for this piece, but the title sort of explains it's called Homewrecker. And I do not crochet, but um, uh, luckily the mother of a friend of mine did crochet it needed to be a big old, old fashioned chainsaw. I really love smashing two gender stereotypes into each other. Um, it was important that it was baby pink. Um, I guess you could say there's a humorous aspect that is sort of always there in my work as well. Um, up, in, up in Maine, the Skowhegan School, I did just a whole bunch of big outdoor pieces because I'd been in art school, we had our little cubbies, we had this shop. We didn't really get to do a lot of large scale work. So I would just keep my eyes open. I saw this wood pile. And I thought, what if I could, you approach it up a driveway facing the wood pile. What if I could create an optical illusion of this thing sort of erupting into the air? So the, I've got a pointer there. This part right here is just slices of logs with a plywood uh, backing to create shadows between them. Um, so it was, it was just, Using whatever I found, I used trees with roots and upended them and did all kinds of things with dead leaves and painted tires. Um, again, the randomness. Um, I had a studio in Brooklyn. I lived in New York for about 18 years. And one day I came out of my studio and there were these stacks of rolls of fabric. And it turns out there was a sweatshop underneath my studio. And all they did in that sweatshop was they made the little ringed collars on the ribbed collars on t-shirts. 
And so the, the rolls of fabric were about that wide. They're in these beautiful colors. And so I thought, this is too good to throw away. And as I had them um, in my studio, I remembered that growing up, um, the braided rugs that were in the homes of a lot of my friends. So these braided rugs were often in homes with a lot of antiques. Um, and for me, those homes with antiques, the vibe was there's this whole connected sort of feeling between generations. But there was a contrast between that and what was actually going on in the homes, which was in some cases, the families were in the process of, of being, you know, torn apart by a divorce. So there was this tension between the decor and the reality. So I thought that was very interesting. And I started making these, these variations on rugs. This piece, um, the idea being, you can try to sweep things under the rugs, but they don't disappear. They're still there. So um, this one is called The Persistence of Guilt. And I made quite a few of these. This one is called Needy Rug. This one was in a show at the Brooklyn Museum and I could not keep people from touching it even when there was a guard there. So I had to go in multiple times to repair it. They would just hug it. They wanted to touch these things, very tactile. This is called Whopper and it springs off the wall. So that's where those things developed. And then I changed again this it didn't fall in my lap, but my brother, who lives on the West Coast, was in a warehouse. He found boxes and boxes of these artificial flowers. And I, um, I just sort of free associate when I get a material. And the flowers reminded me, uh, we lived in Vermont for a while, and it reminded me of those, the, the, the meadow flowers around the house in Vermont. And it made me think about the way people idealize life in the country. Um, and childhood and the, and the sort of nature of memory. Memories are real, but they're not real, but they are at the same time, right? They're real to you, my memories are real to me, but, but they're just, they're thoughts. So in this piece, I created, uh, this is a three-dimensional thing. This is, a, this is a mirror. So the tire swing is completed by its own reflection. So it's there and not there at the same time. So this is a mirror that is a, um, it's a membrane. Uh, if you use a glass mirror, there'd be that little quarter inch of clear glass between the object and the, the reflection. So I, I went to a, uh, a show business supply house in New Jersey, found this, um, this amazing mirror. And um, not from this angle so much, but even the rope was doubled up. Let's see if we get a detail of that. So it was pretty seamless. At the opening, um, the, uh, the director of the gallery had a dog and the dog just sat there staring at himself for 15 minutes, I think. It was really great. There's, I don't know why I have so many details, but there's some of the flowers. So um, sometimes an opportunity comes in the form of a residency. Uh, you all know the Kohler company that makes toilets, tubs, brass fixtures, sinks, uh, faucets. And they have an amazing artist residency program where we get to work right in the factory along with the workers. And part of that was making objects out of brass if you wanted to do cast brass. So here again, um, I started to free associate. And in my mind, brass is something I associate with sort of domestic objects like uh, door knockers or parts of saddles or functional things. So I found an antique chair, I made it made it, created molds, and we cast these five of these chairs in solid brass. So each one of these weighs uh, more than 200 pounds. They're really, really heavy. And it was very, very, um, it was a big deal to polish them because they came out of, they came out very rough out of sand molds. Um, that was a whole nother story, but I bonded with those uh, factory workers. We, we, uh, we, we forged a connection. Um, here's a detail of that. Um, there's also a story connected with these because it's sort of the moral of the story is you never know where something's going to end up. Uh, I had these in my studio in Brooklyn. I had a tour come through from a museum and a lady asked if they were for sale. I said, yes. She said, this is perfect. I've been looking for something to use as a headstone over my dead poodle. So somewhere in the Catskill Mountains, this sits on a hillside looking at the view with Fifi or whatever the poodle's name was lying underneath it. Now this is a globe. This is an idea, 
it didn't wasn't materials fell on my lap. This was a half awake in the morning kind of, I like this idea. I think I'm going to do it. And three years later, this was the end result. Um, the globe is about 42 inches in diameter. It weighs over 200 pounds. And it's made out of, I would have the kids try and guess what the materials are. But before I tell you, this is a detail. It's showing actually at the time I started this piece, Hurricane Sandy was coming into the East Coast of the US. Um, and so that is what that shows. But there, um, what it actually is, is 300,000 300, wooden matches that are dipped in uh, gouache paint and flame retardant and then stacked up on top of each other. So to me, it could be, it could be read as having to do with um, what, whatever, many things, uh, climate change, uh, political tensions, overpopulation, the, just the, uh, the incredible delicate nature of the surface of the earth and the environment. Uh, it's open to interpretation. Um, and I was sitting in the living room one night with my kids and we were thumbing through the annual uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not. And I said, I can't believe it, the globes in this thing. So you never know, again, where things might go. Um, these, are, these are a pair of shoes, uh, wingtip shoes. Um, again, I, I like using materials that are, are loaded, you might say, that have like built-in content, a narrative. Um, and the conversation between the material and the object, I hope brings up a whole wide um, range of issues. Um, these are about seven feet long, so you could easily sit inside them. They are made out of black licorice. Um, what happened here was, um, this was another idea um, I came up with on my own, and I do not remember where I got it, but um, I do know that I based on memories of being a little kid crawling through my dad's closet and coming across those wingtip shoes um, and thinking these giant boats of shoes are what in the kind of world is it that you, when you're a grown up, you put these on and go down to an office. And then also my grandmother kept a crock of black licorice candy. So I melded those two memories and put it out there. So the laces were made from clothesline dipped in paint, but everything else is uh, licorice, which is adhered to a giant block of carved styrofoam with black silicone caulk. Uh, now these ones were, um, these are piggy banks. And I love the, I, I always wanted to work in glass. I was always jealous in a way uh, in art school of the glass majors. Anything that came off the end of the pipe was basically kind of eye candy and beautiful and they did great at the student sales. So these are lead crystal. I wanted um, to do three banks of three piggy banks of people that are, have some notoriety attached to them, uh, connected with money. So the three individuals are Martha Stewart, Sam Walton, the Walmart founder, and guess who? This was before um, he got into politics. So um, that was that project. The, the name of the installation is. Um, uh, let's see, Sam, let's see, Donald, Martha, and Sam is the name of the installation. So then, because these took, again, about three years to make, and they were very expensive, glass can break your heart um, in a whole bunch of ways. But I wanted to make something that was more, uh, less expensive, I could do as multiple. So I made this piece. Um, this, these are two pretzels. Uh, the name of the piece is Comic and Tragic Pretzels, because that's that's a that's a New York pretzel, and you know the kind of thing I would make lunch out of sometimes. And it always struck me that they look like a smiling face, so I wanted to do its opposite, uh, the other side. There's a detail of that. Lead crystal is amazing. When you hold it up in a bright sunlight, it's like it has a, a neon light inside of it. Um, again, going back to art school, I was also, I'm not consumed by jealousy, but I would look at my ceramics friends and they got to eat off the stuff they make. And, and even within that department, the joke was make something out of blue and white and you can sell it. Um, so this was my first public commission. It's at the headquarters of Progressive Insurance, uh, the, you know, flow and all that. Um, this is an employee dining room. The situation was... They wanted some artwork on the walls. There's site-specific work all throughout this building. It's an amazing collection. They couldn't have something under glass 
because of windows nearby, it'd be all reflections, but they couldn't have something that protruded because with the tables right there, it would be a hazard for people standing up and bumping into it. So I thought to myself, why don't I make something that has a domestic vibe to offset the, the sort of corporate culture that people are working in every day to sort of make that a more welcoming place and also leave a message. So what I did was um, I created a rebus, which is where uh, symbols or pictures add up to um, make a sentence. For instance, I heart New York is I love New York. So if you look at this, we don't see the whole thing in this slide, but is G plus rind. And then down here it's on the cups, it says plus I N G. So grinding one's teeth. These are images of deer, female deer, does, not, fill. Again, ones, the word one on these. And then, well, this is the whole thing, bell plus Y. So altogether, it reads, grinding one's teeth does not fill one's belly. So um, this is a reminder to workers to um, just let it go. Don't, don't stress. Don't, don't, uh, don't worry about it. It's just a job. Uh, let's see if I have a detail. There we go. It was fun to make. I, I, I bought a kiln and, and did the things right in my studio. And um, it, was, it was a fun piece. So that, that was my first commission. This has been my biggest commission. It is, um, it's in the airport in Cleveland. Um, they did a new uh, terminal for Continental Airlines. And my thought here was, um, why don't I do something that uh, helps dissolve that ball of anxiety that people traveling through the airport carry around with them? Um, you know, uh, you're late, you don't like to fly, whatever. So my thought was, I'm going to remind people of their first interaction with flight during childhood, um, making paper airplanes and letting them go. In my, in my case, um, I had another memory, which is um, that uh, for my 10th birthday, my family took uh, my brother and I to an Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, and it was the first time my brother and I were allowed to stay in a hotel room by ourselves. And we quickly realized that um, the dresser drawers had a paper lining on the bottom, which we could take out and fold into giant paper airplanes and um, raise the window and let them go out over downtown Dayton, Ohio. Um, and I told that to the jury. Uh, but what I didn't tell them was that before we let them go out the window, we lit them on fire. And I don't know where we got matches or whatever, but that was, that was big fun back then. So that was informing my thing. These are, these are made out of uh, aluminum uh, that's bolted together in sections and then covered with giant like bus wrap technology, digital photos of a single sheet of paper. There were two atrium spaces. Um, they also let me um, uh, come up with a color scheme for the walls. So this one goes from light blue to dark blue. Uh, from the bottom to the top, and the other one is reversed. This one, if you saw the top of it, you would see that there's the uh, green and white dot matrix uh, computer paper. And I put my family's names and dates of birth as the data. So there's a detail. This is another commission. It's uh, again in Cleveland. Um, this is at a retirement home, and it's the Aquatic Therapy Center. And the person who donated the money for it as a thank you, the the, uh, the retirement home board commissioned some artworks for that uh, therapy center. This, I immediately went to the pool because I've always loved the lifesaving equipment around the pool uh, as objects. These are, these are lifesavers. They look like intentionally like lifesaver candies as well, except that instead of the raised letters saying lifesavers, um, they have another um, proverb on them just like the uh, grinding one's teeth on the porcelain. Um, what I didn't anticipate was the, the, the impact of having them reflected in the water. Um, it's kind of the first time I felt like a public artwork had a significant um, emotional impact attached to it. Uh, because uh, in this place, the, the reasoning behind the idea for me was that um, people that are living there are dealing with decline and the end of life which can be seen as a very sad uh, stage of life, but I wanted to remind them that they are um, surrounded by, by friends and supporters. And so that was reflected in the proverb, which says, many waters cannot quench love, 
nor can rivers drown it. So that was intended as um, a message of support, um, just in the same way that actual life preservers uh, support people. And there's a light above each piece that had a sort of fiber optic effect um, lighting up the, uh, the preserver. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a, uh, this piece was done for the Kohler Arts Center um, on the occasion of their silver anniversary. They said, we have a long hallway gallery. Can you come up with something on the theme of silver? For me, that was all about formality um, and etiquette um, when I think of silver. Um, and so I wanted to um, play with that. And so I created a 30 piece dinner setting where everything is welded into place. Um, playing on the idea of going to a upscale fancy dinner where you're, the intimidation is which fork do I use for what purpose? These were numbered, stamped, um, and rigidly welded into place. So um, at the time I'm in New York and I made this out of a, uh, one of those things to keep butter cold. Um, uh, this is a plumbing flange. There's a cake tray. Um, a uh, whole combination of things, but everything was gilded with aluminum. I did it in silver first, but that quickly tarnished, so I had to redo the whole thing. Um, this is uh, just the ending of the work of uh, non-sneaker-related work. Um, I don't want you guys to worry. This is going to go on too long, but this is a piece that's on display now at a museum in Washington, D.C. called the Krieger Museum. Um, the assignment, if you could call it that, uh, was for myself and 16 other artists that are in my studio building um, in D.C. to pick a piece from the collection of the museum um, and do a contemporary artwork in response to that piece, which I love that as an idea. Um, I had never been to the museum, so I went up there and I visited on this beautiful fall day and I'm walking around outside the museum. It was designed by Philip Johnson, who is an architect who's famous, most famous for his glass house. Um, it's in Connecticut and it's one of these super modern minimalist homes where most of the walls are glass. And even in this building, there's many floor to ceiling windows. So to me, the sort of signature of that work is that inside and outside flow together. So I came across a magnolia seed pod and then it inspired me to start collecting leaves. And then the, the, the idea came that I wanted to make a leaf pile, but an inside leaf pile. And then the other inspiration was from reading the biography of Mr. Krieger. This was his home, and it was intended to be a museum after he and his wife passed away. And um, the thing is, he made his fortune as the chairman and CEO of Geico Insurance. So in effect, it was car accidents that helped pay for this amazing temple of, of culture. Um, which I just think is really interesting. I'm not, I'm not being critical of him. He was an amazing um, philanthropist, but um, this is a leaf pile made out of salvaged auto parts, which I gathered from um, junkyards. Most of them had been in accidents, so they were contorted by that. And I bent them up myself. Uh, there's about 900 leaves and there they are in a detail. So again, I'm using a material that I feel has a, comes with a built-in um, narrative, built-in emotional, visual load. All the colors are just whatever I, um, whatever that original auto part was. Um, and now we get to the sneakers and we get back to the randomness. randomness. So the randomness came in a, two different ways. The first part was that uh, I was asked to, to do a show, to come up with an idea, to do an installation in this shipping container. This shipping container is, is called the Mobile Art Gallery. And the organization named Cultural DC, they move it around Washington DC and every location, a different artist will do an installation in the shipping container. And the goal is to broaden the audience for contemporary art. Because a lot of people aren't necessarily comfortable coming to a museum to see contemporary art. Um, that's not a you know, shocking bit of news. But this, um, this, this accomplishes it, I think, because uh, when I first went to see it, um, it had a, an amazing installation at, uh, of an artist that created a barbershop. And it was brought into a neighborhood where barbershop culture is one of the, the, the mainstays of the neighborhood. There were free haircuts on Saturdays. It was like this contemporary art installation that was 
a, became a gathering place for the community. People met there, the free haircuts. It just took all that sort of chilly intimidation that some people might feel from uh, modern art, contemporary art, whatever you want to call it, and made it so approachable. And I thought this is really a hard act to follow. But um, I started researching shipping containers. And in the process of doing that, I came across a story uh, which is the Great Shoe Spill of 1990. And in that, that story, what happened was, and here's the randomness kicking in, during a storm, one of those giant ocean going freighters that stacks up the shipping containers, got caught in the storm, five containers fell off. Every year about 1,500 go into the ocean. But this one, five of them went down, 80,000 Nikes went into the ocean, they, uh, they floated, um, left shoes, in fact, went, tended to go one way and right shoes the other because of the currents and the, the way the air uh, catches the sneakers. Um, and as the months went by, they started washing ashore on the coast of Oregon and Washington. So, of course, what happened next was a whole network of beachcombers developed that would collect the shoes, uh, wash them, and then resell them. And they had this whole elaborate system of record keeping so they could keep track of this. An oceanographer's mother lived in that area, gave him the, the news of what was going on. And he had the brilliant idea of connecting with these beachcombing people and creating data that led to a really, really important study of the ocean's currents, which I thought was just amazing because you start off with something, it's a commodity, it turns into trash, but then amazingly, it turns into something great again. And so, um, I decided I was gonna go into the business of making sneakers. Um, and, um, but the other light bulb moment in this project was when I made the decision to make the sneakers out of stuff I pulled out of the recycling bins. Um, so just like the sneakers were pulled out of the ocean, I would pull the materials out of uh, the garbage, basically. So here I am in the interior of the shipping container. I wanted to create an environment much like a shoe store. Um, a sort of a, a retail thing, but I use the murals of the waves on the wall to reference that, that origin story. Um, here we are putting up the murals. And I was not prepared for the response that this work got. Um, it's something I think we'll probably talk about afterwards, but sneakers, as I learned very quickly, are something that people connect with so directly and in such a, with such enthusiasm and in such a broad diversity of, of ways and, and the people that, that respond to them. So it's been an amazing thing. Um, in that, that shipping container, that was going to be the original thing, uh, the original venue, I would show it. But COVID hit, um, again, randomness, um, put it off for a year, which normally you would think would be a real, you know, I've been working toward this. But that year gave me um, really valuable time to develop the work further. Um, so in the meantime, a museum in Vermont, uh, Brattleboro, Vermont, uh, stepped in and said, we would love to have the show. We will we'll, we'll show it with restrictions and so forth, but let's do it there. And that was, that was amazing. So I did a mock-up of the gallery. Um, it was a much different configuration than the shipping container. So I decided that it would be like a, a, like a, a shoe vault of a high-end sneaker collector. And there's the mock-up, so we go there, and that's, that's what it looked like. I used the same murals as the background. The galvanized steel shells I liked because they reflected the blue background, and they had sort of an industrial feel to them. There's a detail of one wall. We even had uh, recordings of foghorns playing uh, in, a, in a quiet way during the installation. This is uh, getting the shoes loaded into. I love the idea of sneakers in the museum um it just is it just is it's just so approachable i don't know and let's face it they're colorful they're they're eye candy in a way so now i'm just going to show some um individual shots of some of my favorite sneakers this is one of the early ones and i found the poster uh, uh on a yard sale it wasn't even a yard sale it was a pile of giveaway stuff it's an audubon uh image which is someone who features in this, in this museum quite, quite prominently. So I loved the forms of the flamingo, how it combined with the shoe. Um, and it also talks about like 
you know, Audubon was, he was a terror. He would, he would, he would slaughter like 300 birds to get that, that one image. So it has to do with what's the impact of humans on nature without, you know, preaching to somebody. This is um, from the same pile of stuff being given away in the lawn. There was a poster of Henry Matisse, the uh, famous for his series of cutouts, his collage uh, artworks. So I thought, of course, I'm going to take cutouts and cut up the cutouts and make a sneaker. Um, this is a store, Barney's is a store, it's no longer around in New York, but people still are mourning its loss. It was a, a clothing store. And um, the publicist at the museum in Vermont, she, she was from New York. She, um, she kept the bags from Barney's and asked me to make a sneaker out of the, um, the shopping bags. So that one's got a tassel for laces. This is um, uh, made from a uh, uh, insulated bag to keep your bottle of Veuve Clicquot champagne cold, if that's your thing. Um, those are the, uh, the leather handles on the bag. And um, this is a combination of things. I like using three different things. Georgetown Cupcake is a, uh, is a very popular um, bakery in uh, Georgetown in DC, Tiffany's, and then uh, you have um, from a thrift store. I like Tiffany's being with a collar right there. It's from a blouse in a thrift store. Um, this is a, a Nike shoe box combined with origami paper. So you have the clash of cultures, just like in actual sneakers. They're made in China. They're, they're bought all over the world, but in the US, US and China, you know, culturally, we depend on each other. Politically, we're at each other's throats sometimes. Um, it's in economically, we depend on each other. So it's a complicated relationship, but that's all sort of baked in here. It's just a sneaker, but you can read all that into it. Um, I have a teenage daughter and this is the result, one of the results of that. Um, even academics like sneakers, as we know from, from Charlie, <laughs> this was made for a uh, commission for a retired chemistry professor from the periodic table of the elements. Um, <laughs> this is the 4th of July, Jordan 5. I should mention these are all Jordan 5s because that iconic sneaker was introduced in 1990, the same year as the spill. This, again, going back to the relationship of the US and China, this, uh, again, was closed, I found, in a thrift store, but um, East meets West, you know? It's one of my favorites. Um, it's, it's sort of, you know, in a way it's, it's sort of stereotypes from both sides clashing together or mixing together, but in a, in a sympathetic way, you know, so maybe you can read it as a, um, as a hopeful kind of combination and Krispy Kreme donuts, just because all these things happen so randomly. I had students helping me create templates for these things and someone brought donuts. So there we go. This is from the artwork. It's made from a print of uh, an artist named Tim Dowd. His studio is right next to mine. So I started taking materials from artists in my building, making pairs of shoes, giving one to them, and keeping one for myself. And this is the result of another artist. She uses inks and dyes and stains. I just love the way it looked like a uh, geologic sort of sedimentary piling up, a, you know, growth rings, whatever. So this is a sneaker in progress. It's, it takes about, in the elaborate ones, there can be as many as about 50 parts in one sneaker. And they take, a sneaker like that would take most of a day to eight or even longer sometimes. But as I've made more and more of these, they've gotten more complicated. So um, instead of getting faster at it, I'm getting slower at it. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, I've done variations on shoes. Um, uh, this is a, a bamboo and rice paper sneaker. I love the idea of taking what you could say is there are a lot of handwork in creating a sneaker, but they are pretty much mass produced objects, but let's make a mass produced object in a very handmade way. Um, and to do that in the course of doing that, one of my students is um, it turned out is an expert in making lion and dragon head masks for uh, Chinese New Year parades and other celebrations. So I got a small grant 
for us to collaborate on a sneaker. And that's the result, lit from the inside. And that's in my studio, that's where I keep the shoes. And um, the thing that's so gratifying about this project is how everybody relates to it. Um, these are people from a board meeting of, a, of an art center in Maryland. They had me come in um, and do in half an hour, do a sneaker project as part of their board meeting activities. None of them had, were artists. Um, we had random materials piled up. I gave them some prompts and uh, we said, let's go, let's just do it. And they just collaged these things. It was a, a, a group effort. But I mean, you look at the smiles on their faces and they really, really had fun doing these things. Um, <laughs> it's like they're like goofy kids at Christmas morning, right? And it was just so much fun. And I, I love that they're not all, you know, Jordan 5s. I said, there's no mistakes, there's no grades, let's go, come on. So off to the races. Um, here's, here we are in my studio again. This young woman brought her boyfriend to my studio as a surprise on his birthday. He had no idea um, what he was in for. He is a massive sneakerhead, and he was just so happy. He couldn't, ex he couldn't get the words out. It was just really great. And that is something that I can't really say I would, I would have as a response to the earlier work I showed you. It's always, you know, it interests people. But in the non-art world, not going to happen. But these are non-art people, and they're just having a ball with the work, which is so gratifying. So I've come to Auburn. Um, it's got this whole amazing uh, slate of programming for me to interact with. In this case, the boys and girls clubs. We're doing, doing sneakers, working on the floor in the gym. They're so full of energy. They relate to the project immediately. It's really been a gas. So they're, they're drawing sneakers. We had a very short amount of time, but they got right to it and, and had a great time. And you can see that, uh, you know, they know what they're talking about up there and Oh, look at that. There's another right there. And it just goes on from there. So um, another class did these, these animations using photographs of my sneakers. And the, the, the sort of uh, organizing idea was, well, what happened to the sneakers after they went in the ocean? And so they made up these stop animation um, uh, stories to go with it. And um, I just love it. I think it's so great that their sneakers can be used as a teaching, teaching tool. Then I went to um, work with the seventh graders at, uh, at the, at the uh, right here in Auburn City Schools. And, and again, um, we had a limited amount of time, three days, but that's not much time. We just have uh, 45 minutes at each class, <coughs> uh, but we pulled it off. And they, these are just the cutout scraps. They had brought in cereal boxes and, um, and the colors were great. We just, there was no time to think. We just had to, to work. This is one of the finished results. Um, they were amazing, the, these kids. They were so cool. They were, the project was creating such a buzz in the school. Um, it was so much fun. And here's some of the things. Some of them are complete, some aren't. But as of today, I'd say 90, 98% of these sneakers are finished. And they're already asking when they can take them home. So... And that is, that is the end of my presentation for, for you, but we're going to do some questions. The light switch. Okay, we're good. How's everyone doing? So good to see you all. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, like Chris said, I am. Oh, there we go. The lights. I was waiting to wait. I was supposed to wait for the lights, and I missed my cue. I apologize. Um, my name is Charlie Lash. Like Chris said, I'm an associate professor of English. Uh, because Andy just mentioned the enthusiasm that some of his work seems to provoke, I want to do uh, quickly just share a story. Earlier today, I was texting a friend uh, from middle school. Um, we still keep in touch. Like, I didn't just randomly reach out to someone from middle school today. But uh, he said, oh, how's work? What are you up to? And I said to him, uh, oh, look at this event that's happening tonight. And I sent him the advertisement uh, for Andy's talk. And he said, could you imagine telling, like, your 12-year-old self 
that part of your job would ask you to come and like talk about sneakers, right? It's just something that's been this lifelong passion of mine. So interacting with Andy's work and some of the programming around it has really just been a thrill for me. So I'm super excited to be here today. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, so I'll get the Q&A started, I'll ask a few, and then we'll open it up for a broader discussion, hopefully with all of you. Um, so like Chris uh, said, I uh, have taught a slate of courses at Auburn University on sneakers and sneaker culture. And one of the things that those classes seem to return to quite a bit is the idea of sneakers as um, biographical in some way. That footwear seems to provoke uh, conversations about who folks are, where they came from, where they've been. And one thing that's really struck me uh, talking to you this week has been how many of the pieces seem to tell a story about you, your mobility, your movement, the things you collect, the people you know, the relationships you have. So I was wondering if you could just share us, with us a little bit about um, the ways that this exhibition is biographical in some way. Sure. Um, uh, materials, it's not just me uh, dumpster diving. Uh, people have brought me materials um, that are important to them. Um, and I've made them out of artists work who I admire. Um, I've made them um, from, uh, from places I've been. Um, I was telling, uh, telling Charlie that on the flight back from visiting my son in Colorado with a roll of uh, comic book reproductions under my arm I'd found in a thrift store, uh, I was sitting in the seat and there's those brochures for the, uh, in case of a water landing, what to do. And so I said, <laughs> I'll take that one, that one, that one, I'll make it into a sneaker because they're Air Jordans. Why, of course you're going to use an airplane brochure. <laughs> um, and I'll literally pull over at the side of the road um, on, on recycling day and start picking up. If there's a Barbie dream house box, I'm not going to let that go. <laughs> um, you know, even the COVID, I said, I put a, uh, in, the, in the, the shipping container, I had the uh, Corona, um, Corona sneaker right next to the Clorox bleach um, <laughs> sneaker. Um, so there's some stuff built into it. Um, but it, there's, there's so many personal stories about the place I was when I got the box. And uh, like, like, for instance, this person, they're passionate about, about Barney's. Um, and so getting that is something that means that they're getting an artwork, a commissioned artwork that has a really personal meaning to them in particular. And that's incredibly gratifying. Mm. Yeah, you mentioned um, you know moving around, being on the airplane. So one of the things that we chatted about earlier was the mobility in these pieces, right? Mm -hmm. The movement that seems, and obviously footwear seems like a really rich uh, object to explore that question of mobility through because sneakers literally move with you, right? They're objects that actually walk along with you. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how that connects to the, the places um, that the exhibition has been shown, right? So you mentioned a couple of the places and how you're really kind of interested in how they prompt accessibility and interactions. I'm curious to hear a little bit about the way you think about how context kind of interacts with this exhibition. I, it's, a, it's an ongoing story because, um, well, the first venue, I used to live in Brattleboro, just outside of Brattleboro, Vermont. So I knew that museum. They, they saw some online um, images and it was like a homecoming for me to yeah. do that, that exhibition. So I had friends coming to the opening that was, that was amazing for me. Um, now, after this show, we're in the process of working out, um, having it travel to a shopping mall where in my neck of the woods in Northern Virginia, which I love the idea of people who are coming to the mall interacting with contemporary art. The mall itself, this is gonna be, I think the third time they've taken an empty retail space and done a beautiful presentation of contemporary artwork. Um, the first one was, um, from a group called Art Lords that brought contemporary art out of Kabul, Afghanistan before things shut down. So, um, you know, this whole thing is so much to do with the impact of consumer culture on the environment. Let's drop it right into consumer culture and celebrate it too. It's not just to be sort of finger wagging. So um, context is so important. That was, I think, the, the thing that got me so excited about the mobile art gallery. It's a, taking it out of the museum context and bringing it to people so that it's more approachable, more comfortable, and more um, just a fresh take. 
Yeah, it's so interesting to hear you talk about shoe stores. So I'm teaching a class right now um, on subcultures and subculture space and how important the spaces that different subcultural groups inhabit can be to their own identity. And we've talked a little bit about kind of, or I've bemoaned, I guess, the kind of um, the death of the in-person sneaker store oh. for sneaker culture, right? A lot of the commerce or a lot of the um, buying and selling of sneakers now happens online, right? Whereas I grew up literally sleeping outside of malls to get particular pairs of sneakers, which sounds a lot crazier when you say it out loud in a microphone. Um, but uh, so one of the things I really love about how the Jewel Collins has set up this ex exhibition is it really brings me back to that moment of just kind of browsing. Oh, nice. Right? Um, so to go back to this question of um, space, I, I took my, um, my class here earlier today and we had a really great conversation with Andy and Chris, um, but I got here a little bit early and there was a, um, uh, pre-K class, I think there were pre-K students here, yeah. um, interacting with the exhibition. And um, I mean, these were these were four-year-olds. I have a four-year-old, so like I was ready for like total chaos when I walked in. Like I was like, things is, this is gonna get real, real fast right now. And they were so engaged, right? They were asking questions and they were picking out favorites and asking, uh, I think, really smart questions of you. And I'm wondering, I think this speaks to how you said in your talk how it seems to attract a really diverse group of audiences. Obviously, we saw the generational you know, gap between my students and these four-year-olds, but I'm wondering if you could just share a little bit more about, um, yeah, the, type, the diversity of audiences that seem to gravitate towards this work. I, I'm a, I guess, I'm not saying this to sort of strut, but it's just, <laughs> see, I don't see the edges of it. It's mm. like so wide. Uh, and that's what's so gratifying to me is that it goes, it crosses so many boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, it's people that are, um, would never go to see contemporary art are, are so enthusiastic about the work and they appreciate, they get the message. You don't have to explain anything. It just says it, but being in a, in delivered in a way that they can relate to. So uh, I think I've said to a couple of people, if I, if I had the choice of being a, a, a sculptor or a guitar playing person that does concerts and arenas, I would switch in a heartbeat because that's just my personality. I'm, I really like connecting with people, but I had never, and, I, and you could sort of tell that from my work that I make recognizable objects, but then I, I just want to change it, tweak the materials, the scale, whatever. But I'd never had a body of work make a connection with people so directly. It's such a broad range of people. So that's being really, really gratifying. And it, it seems like the different groups kind of connect with it in different ways. Yeah. And I remember the first time I saw your work, my mind immediately went to what you mentioned, which these are Jordan 5s. Uh -huh. Like that became really important for me because that sneaker was really important to me growing up. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, one of the four-year-olds was like, oh, tell me about the Barbie shoe, yeah. right? <laughs> uh-huh. Well, that's what happens it, is that people, it's like brand recognition is a big part of this. And um, also nostalgia, because some of these like these snacks, these treats, the crackers, uh, the Krispy Kreme, that brings people to their foods, that time of life, their favorite things. Um, there's a lot of also a very lot of a lot of smart smart people that have designed these logos, um, designed to get your their hooks into you to make you buy that product, and then to jumble them all together. I wanted to create this sort of um, that the noise, that visual noise of going down aisle 12 in the grocery store in the cereal aisle and all the, the choco whatever versus the natural, um, all of them vying for your attention, making it really arduous to decide which one to buy. Uh, I just sort of feel like I got my hooks into this thing and it's just pulling me along from all that force and, and built in power of like Heinz ketchup. And the mm. people just start standing there and looking and saying, oh, that one, that one, that one, and asking questions, and they're immediately fully involved in the work. Yeah, it was, it was really amazing today hearing my students and the different conversations they were having around specific pieces, like uh -huh. uh, the Lululemon bag was a, a real kind of lightning rod of conversation because apparently, which I didn't realize, uh, one of the students shared that she would buy something cheap from Lululemon when she was a kid and then go buy something from a different store but put the other store's thing inside the Lululemon bag, um, which I thought was hilarious, right? But ultimately changes the way you interpret the piece. Yeah, yep. 
Um, I have one more question, and then I think we'll open it up a little bit. Um, you mentioned um, touch as something that seems to be really important. In your, like any good lecture, I came with like a few questions, and now I have like 30, but I'll only ask one more, I promise. Um, you mentioned touch and people, I mean, you mentioned kind of in the, uh, the, the rug uh, piece you did, folks wanted to hug it. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that looked like a rug in my grandmother's house. So I was okay. kind of like, oh, I remember those braided rugs yeah. really well. Um, and you do seem to be drawn to that sort of interactive materiality in your yeah. work. And I was wondering if you could just share a little bit about why do you seem to kind of return to these, these objects and these materials that people seem to want to, to touch or interact with? I, th I think the reason I'm a sculptor is because you, you're interacting with real materials in the real world. And in the process of finding materials, you're, you're going to junkyards, you're going to, um, you're going to um, uh, show business supply houses. You're dealing with people that have stuff and then you're interacting with those people. And I wanna continue that in the piece. So I'm making things that I think are, that are, have a built-in, like I wanna, I wanna have people wanna touch them and, and be stimulated by them. So I made things out of, you know, uh, tobacco leaves or, or the licorice or um, artificial roses and um, anything I, I get my hands on. And they, they just resonate with me. And I think out of my own enthusiasm, it's usually something that um, usually other people do as well. And, and sneakers, especially as, as material objects, like seem to provoke a particular way of handling, right? Uh, we were talking earlier today about one of the, the ways that sneaker heads um, tell real sneakers from replicas or fake sneakers is you smell them because the glue of replica models often smells slightly off and you can tell what's a real Nike versus what's just a fake one. Um, so I've smelled my fair share of shoes in my life and uh, which also sounds weirder when you say it on a microphone uh, in front of people. But uh, so there's something about the exhibition kind of wants, you know, I want to interact with them the way I interact with my shoes. And I've been interacting with my shoes since I was, you know, six. Um, so um, I'll open it up now. I know Amani, one of my wonderful students who took a uh, sneaker class with me, uh, has a question. So I'll turn it over to her. I just wanted to ask, do you feel like the story, particularly the environmental aspect, has gotten lost in the to say, I guess, this aspect of the, the sneakers? I love that question, but um, I'm happy to say no. Um, in fact, it's been front and center. Um, one of the, besides the personal responses from, um, from people in the galleries that where it's shown, we've gotten a lot of media attention, and the first thing they gravitate, the reason they, they feel like this story is, is something they want to publicize is because of the environmental message. So uh, PBS NewsHour did a profile where they did a beautiful computer animation of the sneakers journey in the ocean. Um, New York Times, um, New York Times did a full page um, profile of the thing, and they said if if the shoe if the shoe floats, something something something. <laughs> and they had they had their graphic designer put these shoes sort of going this way and that way and they they love the environmental side of it and when people hear that origin story that's when it goes to the next level they're like wow this is more than just you know some paper sneakers that they're fun to look at but that is such a cool story that's the quote this is such a cool story so it gets them excited and um just adds that extra layer which i think is so so important to the work um and that cuts across, again, it's not everybody gets that. The kids get it. Um, the grown-ups get it. The art world, the academics get it. And it, yeah, so it's there. We even had a symposium uh, led by, there was an oceanographer from the Baltimore Aquarium. There was the chief aide to Senator Udall. They had put through the biggest recycling bill ever in the history of Congress. And uh, there was one other person, I can't recall offhand, but the the... Uh, the aide to Senator Udall said, to me, what's exciting about this is it's presenting the environmental impact uh, of consumer culture in a fresh way. And it's getting around that message fatigue that the issue suffers from, that that's what we're fighting to try and get this legislation passed. 
So it's a weapon, a tool that can actually make a huge difference in, in, that, in the world. So, um, and another sidebar to that is the, the impact. They were used, uh, I was commissioned by a foundation that does cancer research to make eight sneakers for their benefit auction. So it was very gratifying to think that these sneakers were helping cancer research. So we definitely have time for more questions if anyone has any questions for Andy. Kind of two parts as I listen. Um, one is, how do you deal with mistakes? Because as we sit and look at the exhibition and everything, I go, oh man, he touches it and boom, it's magic. But I wonder, is there another room on the screen you didn't show that, you know, that's one. The second is, have you, is there a shoe you really want to design that you haven't yet? Because I see all the creativity in you, and I wonder, like, man, one day, you know, for us that are shoe head, you know, one day I'm going to own mm -hmm. that shoe. Or mm -hmm. is there one, you know, by which one day I want to design one like this? Oh, man, wow. Well, mistakes are fully on display. In fact, um, you can see a prototype in the in the – in the entry hall, there's a blank white shoe. That's one of the early prototypes. But around the corner down the hallway is another white shoe, but it's got a lot of staples in it. Before I figured out that I could make them out of reclaimed packaging, I was like, they'll all be white. I'm going to use staples that'll look just like the stitching in the sneakers. And it was a colossal flop. It looks <laughs> the ugliest thing. I was like, why did they put that in the show? But it's I'm, now I'm glad, of course, they did. But... Um, the early ones, I won't call them mistakes, but they look really crude and clunky to me. But I'm, you know, I'm, I've got my eye, eyes open, but I could show you the difference. They didn't have shoelaces on them, um, and now they do. But they just look less developed, but that's the way it goes, you know. And you, part of being, like what I preach to my students is you have to forgive yourself. You've got you to be open to those mistakes because that's where the really good stuff is. If all you're doing is taking your idea and just fabricating it exactly as it is in your mind's eye, what's the point, really? It's just going to be very predictable in a way. Or it's not going to be something we haven't seen before. It's that top of your brain, but it's that stuff in the deeper parts that we don't really use until we trip over it or it bumps into us or we drop something. And there's story after story of artists having these kind of accidents leading to something good. Um, and then as far as the one I'd love to design, oh, boy, I'd, I'd love to see any of these, a lot of these in there. Um, I can't say if I'd put my finger on one. I think that that Flamingo shoe as an Audubon series would be amazing. Um, maybe part of the reason I say that is because I think of shoes as a form of plumage. How do you, how do you put yourself out there in the world? How do you advertise <laughs> your taste, you know, who you are, your personality? It's a great way for kids to express themselves that's not costing them an arm and a leg, like a jacket or, you know, some other piece of clothing. And it's like a, a way of communicating with other people. So they're really like, it's a way of presenting a message. And um, so I, I, would, I would jump at the opportunity to do an actual shoe. I hope it comes along. There's a question. All right, I hope you can hear me. Um, all right, so here's a question. Number one, does Harry Styles know about that shoe? <laughs> and does he want that shoe? Boy. And then here's another side. Like, um, I have a son who is an incredibly gifted artist, very young, 18 years old. And when somebody asks him to do something, he gets really stressed. And it, it, then the creativity is diminished. And then it becomes more like, am I going to please this person? So my question is, I can see all kinds of companies and people wanting to commission you to do shoes for them. And I'm wondering if for you, if that's something you struggle with too, when you are asked to do something specific by somebody, if that, how that affects your creativity 
and and how you deal with um, any kind of like stress that comes from yeah. being asked to do something specific. You know what? I have more of a problem for uh, an open-ended commission um, because the more rules or preset conditions um, or circumstances that are specific to that commission, that's like grist for the, for the mill or primes the pump. It gives me something to, to chew on and, and bounce ideas off of. So those I actually like. The scariest thing for me is a blank canvas. Like, let's do a piece of artwork here. What's it, what am I supposed to, you know, base it on? So um, I totally understand your son's feelings. I have the same feelings every time. And um, like, for instance, now there's an opportunity for a COVID memorial. So COVID is one thing, but it's such a big, vast thing. And it's the site they want an outdoor, it's an outdoor site and they want water to be part of it, but it's just this open expanse of bricks. So kaboom, what do I do there? It's, it's a little, that's a little intimidating. So I'll have to, I'll just have to, what I do is when that kind of opportunity comes along, I tuck it away and it's in the back of my mind. So that when I'm half awake in the morning or I'm taking a shower where your mind is sort of free associating, then hopefully something little trigger will come on. And, and catch it. Like my first commission was that way, it was that airport piece, right? And I was in the waiting room of the hospital, pacing the, the floor waiting <laughs> for my first son to be born. And uh, <laughs> I remember the Yankees were winning the World Series, but whatever. I was like, bam, paper airplanes, of course, that's it. And it was just like, it was there, but I wasn't trying to think about it specifically. The more I try and, I'm gonna take a sketchbook and I'm gonna try and work this out, I never get any good ideas that way. It's always a sort of bumping into it or tripping, backing into it or something. And Harry Styles, if, if the Instagram is worth anything, it's going to get that to his attention. And if that happens, my daughter, she, lo she loves me, but this would be a whole other category. That would be insane. He's a really cool guy. I mean, let's face it. Yeah, so, I agree. Yeah. Well, I hope he contacts you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, but it's being recorded, you see. So without the microphone, recorded. no one, the, the wider audience <laughs> won't hear you. No pressure or anything. Um, I want, you had mentioned, you know, how wide the audience is for this project and how mm -hmm. gratifying that has been for you. And especially when you talked about, like, maybe wanting to be a rock star based yeah. off of, like, I can sense that feeling and mm -hmm. how that must feel. How will that impact you and your future projects? Is that something you feel like you will need to or want to replicate? Or do you think Ooh. that there will be no impact? If you try and make stuff to just to, to make, you know, I, in, at least in my experience, trying to make um, entertain people directly leads to pretty shallow stuff. But if you follow your, your, your gut and make stuff like, I'm happy I did the leaf pile. I think I needed to do the leaf pile because it was a change of pace from the shoes. I'm still making shoes occasionally, but um, it's just an important part of me. And in fact, the leaf pile has connected with people and they find out it's made out of auto parts. So it's kind of reassuring that I won't have to hang up that, that, that way that people connect with my works. You know, it won't, I don't have to make sneakers to have that kind of response, but I'm going to miss that, that thing. Maybe I'll still make them for, you know, for, for decades. Who knows? Um, I think we're one celebrity endorsement away from this thing really going <laughs> onto the next level, uh, which would be great. Um, we're working on a pair of shoes that was made for Steph Curry, getting those to him. Um, it's made from photographs of his wife's cookbooks. Ayesha Curry does some amazingly, really cool cookbooks. Um, so who knows? That's the kind of fun of it is the, the sort of they're out there floating around just like those original shoes were in the ocean and the, the ripples are still, are still working their way out and they keep on, it, well, for a while there it was like, well, it's been a week now, where's the next you know, newspaper article, or the next commission? It was, I was getting very spoiled, but they're like my little ambassadors and they, they're doing great online. 
one of the smartest things I did, if I can say that, was have really, really good glamour shots taken of the sneakers so they have that pop when people see them. So it's, it's yet to be decided. I don't play an instrument, unfortunately, so I think my future as a rock star is <laughs> probably, I could do a tambourine if I have to. <laughs> There's another question. Well, I want to share a thought first. With your water piece and COVID, it can be the ever-flowing waters of hand sanitizer. That nice. Would be, that would be dope. That's cool. For you, I know you talked about how people connect with your art. Art is definitely a catharsis. What art do you do for yourself? What art do I like to look at? What art do you keep for yourself? Oh, or do you look at for yourself? Yeah. That, that would be, boy, if I had a bigger budget. Uh, <laughs> but I find things that are so, I, I have a wide variety of things. Like what I live with, um, I found a sign in a, a, a th in a flea market in Vermont. It said, Little Paintings of Vermont by E.B. Dutton or something like that. And I just thought this is the most beautiful thing, the way it was lettered and the way it expressed the feeling and the place. Um, I, have, I have a palette of dried up oil paint. It's so colorful. It's from an artist that I used to work for as a studio assistant. Um, I have uh, photographs of friends. A lot of the artwork I have on my walls is from friends whose work I really, really like. And sometimes we'll trade, we'll trade work. Um, and everybody has stories of the ones that got away. And there's a, there's a couple of those. Um, but um, it's very personal kind of work. Um, Sometimes something has been that I grew up with that I just held on to. Um, but I, I have to, because I'm an artist, I don't have, you know, really deep pockets. So I can't just go to, to places. But I'll have reproductions of, of stuff that I really admire. And they, I find them to be really inspirational. Um, a lot of times those are sculptors, but it may be a photograph or a painting. Um, and um, I just never know. But... It can be common everyday objects too. It can be a little um, open studio for twenty-five dollars, and I'll I'll pick that up. And I'm so so glad I did. Um, so kids art also not just my own kids, but I think kids run circles around um, mature so-called professional artists. Um, so it's it's almost like a diary of my life, you know these things, and um, it's just really. Um, that's a really vague answer, but you get the idea. <laughs> no, it sounds just like what you said. It's your oh, own personal connection yeah. to the art. So I, I do know, you know, I've heard talks by um, one of them I remember was Agnes Gunn. She was the chairman of the board of the Museum of Modern Art, and she's a very, very well-known collector. She said, this is all stuff that I just love personally. I never have in my life bought a piece just as an investment for, you know, the kind of that, that side of things. And it just so happens that these things have become, you know, very, very valuable, but that's, that's where the people who collect, that's usually why they do it. Something in that thing, they just really respond to in a personal way. And it resonates like a bell rings when they look at that work. The stuff I live with, I look at time and time again, and it never feels like it's, it's, it's boring, like it's gotten old. Yep. Hi. Hi. Well, first, I have worn my Jordans to death since you have put this exhibit up. So <laughs> I want to say thank you for that personal connection. Aww. But also, speaking of celebrities, has Jordan ever tried to contact you? I mean, Jordan is, this is a big shoe that you've decided to try to, that you've worked with. And I'm just wondering if he's ever reached out or well, not, Nike or anything. Not Mike. Um, I haven't heard from Mike yet. Um, I'm waiting. <laughs> Um, I have had a couple people approach Nike because they do work with artists, uh -huh. and it's not easy. It's been no. a deafening silence so far, but um, I'm an optimist, so you never know what might come of it. I I'm celebrating. We... I am celebrating their shoe. Yeah, if we can get Charles to come take a picture with your shoe here. He might get, get him oh, with the, yeah, yes. since he was the, right. well, you know, Charles Barkley would get him here. And... Yeah. yeah. Go for that. I'm on your side. <laughs> I know. Oh, yeah, right. yeah, for a good reason. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hey. Um, 
sorry. So I just wanted to give a little context before I answer the, um, ask you the question. So I was try I'm in Auburn right now as a freshman trying to get um, a degree in graphic design in the pre-graphic pre design um, program. I had a drawing class that one of my professors uh, was brought me to the June Collins Museum and I was able to see your work. And I felt like that was inspiring for me. Wow. Um, and that's why I came here to like listen and try to figure out what, what describes you. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm the reason being why I wanted to be in graphic design is like I wanted to create sub. Um, I want to have that creativity and maybe like go into filmmaking industry. So if I wanted to make a shoe and you know I have an idea of where to go, um, so what, what would you suggest where to go to figure out that process? Oh, I'd look for an internship at just offer just there's there's amazing benefit to um, volunteering on something and word of mouth um, at a place where I mean look approach two companies they're, they're, the worst that can happen is they say no but especially you've got youth on your side you know you're willing as an intern to help them out for nothing they they can use those kind of people and they're always looking for new people they want to hire people that are you know young energetic um you've gotten a real advantage right there so um i would say are if, if you aren't hiring could you do you have ways of suggesting who i might talk to or where i might go because i'm very interested in the field of shoe design or uh sneakers or something where to take that there's there's going to be somebody who's going to say well there's nothing here but have you thought of this that or the other thing and um, I just think that personal connection um, is the way to go. I just find some of my biggest opportunities aren't the things I apply for directly. They're because someone has thought of my work or seen my work, and they talk to somebody else, and it winds its way back to me. So um, start with your professors, because professors, they don't just live in their office. They live outside their office, and in their field, they're going to know people. And if you're doing, especially if you're someone who shows interest and energy, they, the best thing you can do, because I teach college as well, you want to make people, you want to you enable your students to succeed and, and have careers and, and make the world a better place. And they're going to go out of their way to put in a word for you somewhere. And that's where the process starts. So it's like the opportunity. This is, you get to your first credit cards, and you get this shot at the job market from an outside, you know, perspective. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, beyond the potential mall installation, are there further plans for the shoes to travel or? Well, this, the, the, I'm, I'm glad you asked. The, um, the show is designed to travel. The display cases are designed to come apart, um, and these are these are how uh, museums and museums at universities or just fine art museums, any kind of museum. A lot of times, the shows come, they're organized and they're packaged, and they travel. So um, that's the intent of this show. And I know the um, the staff here at the museum has always had that as their plan. So I'm I'm. I'm hoping that it comes to, you know, comes, comes, to, comes to be that way. But the mall thing was, um, that came to me because the uh, County Arts Commission knows my work and they connected with the mall. And so I was able to bring an opportunity to the museum, which is great because it'll have a place to go to directly and give them that much more time to develop other places for it to go. So I'm excited by that possibility. That was great. Any last questions, comments? Andy, thank you so much for your work. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Charlie, thank you so much for the conversation. And thank you, everyone, for, for being here.
you want, but it's over here. 